This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. I'm Marcy Ferry, and we're Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices in life. Today, we will journey, explore, and discover an area that I think is one of Oahu's most exciting and mysterious neighborhoods. First established in 1840 through 1850, or somewhere like that, by the Native Hawaiians, and as Honolulu grew, so did this area. Chinatown is the oldest and most authentic Chinatown in the United States. The Chinatown Special Historic District is adjacent to downtown Honolulu's business district, which is rich in history and culture and all kind of wonderful things. And if I sound like a travel agent, I'm not. <laughs> Since 1973, it has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The city and county of Honolulu created a special design district in 1991 with the express desire to keep the character and sense of place. The jumbled streets come alive every morning and bustling and bustling with residents and visitors from all over the world. It's a cacophony of sound, high-pitched vendors in markets and lyrical dialects and old men retired talking story over games and mahjong and brilliant reds and blues and greens from all the buildings. And of course, I'm the only person in Chinatown that doesn't, that speaks English that early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all the mama-sons are out <laughs> buying vegetables, you know. <laughs> and the streets are just full at dawn. All of the best chefs in Honolulu are buying fish right off the boat. It is just wonderful. But most people, their memories of Chinatown are drawn from the war years. It was about brothels and bars. It was a crossroads of Honolulu. King Street, which we're on, is the longest street and main thoroughfare in Honolulu. And people came from all districts all over the island to Chinatown, to buy, to shop, to all this. And right across the river is what was known as J-Town, which was Japantown. So this side of the river was Chinatown, and that side was J-Town, and it lost its identity. No one but you and me knows that this <laughs> is a, there was such a thing as J-Town. Hotel Street ran from the river all the way through to the gardens of the Alani Palace. And there was fish markets and dry goods stores and barber shops and tattoo parlors and pinball. And on every street corner, there was a photographer with a box camera and a cardboard palm tree and a girl pretending to be a hula girl. And these were the years of the sailors when they comb the streets of Honolulu. This is really for, during the war for little towns in Iowa and whatnot. This is all so new and so wonderful to them before they went into battle. So I guess we call this a, the crossroads. Um, and anyway, that's enough about me in Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, introduce you to my dear friend, Stanford Ewan, who um, showed me so much of Chinatown, so much of what I've learned and come to love about Chinatown. Stanford is, is a leader in Chinatown. I'm going to read this to get it right. The Chinese Community and Cultural and Arts District, a downtown neighborhood board he was a past president of Mon Lung School, one of the nation's largest and oldest Chinese language school. He is also on the Board of Regents for the University of Hawaii, as you can see with his shirt. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, Stanford. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. 
So, how are you? Talk to me. <clears throat> Marcia, it's so good to see you again and to talk about our favorite subject, Chinatown. Um, you know, there's a lot going on, and uh, it's people like you who continue to keep it in the limelight uh, such that, you know, the people in the state know what's going on. So, thank you. Well, you know, I am upset about those ugly, ugly, what do you call those bulb out? Bulb out, yes. Uh, the bulb out, for anybody that doesn't know, or I didn't know until I saw it, an awful name, isn't it? The bulb out extends the sidewalk, and the idea is for pedestrians. However, in streets that go back to 1800s, the narrow streets of Chinatown, oh, there's the bulb out. Yes. Yeah. Those streets are so narrow that emergency vehicles can't make the turn. Uh, the garbage can't, trucks can't get delivery trucks. So now we have merchants who are going out of business. Now, this was done by the city, by the Department of Transportation, and the city has, uh, they're the ones that created the special design district. So they have violated their own rules. Now what do we do? I totally agree with you. And, um, but let, let me say this. Um, the city, whether they knowingly or, or not knowingly, um, are strangling the businesses, the small business in Chinatown. Uh, they're fighting for their lives, their livelihood. And I think what the city has done was to create uh, more barriers um, and restrictions on on how they do go about doing their operation. Now, I sat on the neighborhood board for 16 years, and the um, the bubble uh, wasn't too much of a problem as the way it was presented to the board. Uh, it showed the expansion the expansion of the sidewalk, uh, but it showed also trucks and delivery uh, vans, you know, being able to park there to offload and, and do their thing. Uh, when the city installed or completed the bulb out, it's a lot different than what was presented. A good example is the, uh, the barriers, you know, those vertical barriers that you've seen. Uh, that's a disgrace. It's, uh, it's defacing Chinatown. Marcia, you brought up the uh, point about Chinatown being a historical district. Uh, to me, it looks more like uh, uh, a restricted area, you know, with those barriers. Uh, again, that's stopping the trucks and, and people uh, from doing their work, delivering items to the stores. Uh, now, when they presented that to the neighborhood board and the community, there were no barriers included. When they installed it, the barrier showed up, and this is where the public outcry that you witnessed. Um, uh, and then that's when the city came back and they said, well, it's only temporary for 90 days. Hello, they did it pre present that to us in the beginning, and we approved it. You know, the board approved it, but it was false advertising. So, so I would ask the city to remove it quickly because, you know, there's petitions going on, almost 3,000 names to remove it for the sake of the merchants, uh, the small business in the community? Well, I talked to two um, lay stand people. Yes. Who've been there for years, 20 years or more. And they're saying they can hardly make the rent because, first of all, the delivery trucks can't pull up. And the, the uh, people that used to pull to the sidewalk, run in and get the lay, run out three minutes and they're gone. Now they can't pull up next to the lay stands. Um, there's just people. I there was well, it was Think Tech. We spent last Friday in Chinatown videotaping all of this, yeah. and we talked to people whose businesses are hurting, restaurants who say they're canceled, large parties because of this. There's nowhere to park, nowhere to to drive up. Delivery trucks can't. Yeah. And I totally agree with you, but I think the city needs to do a better job in um, 
uh, being more compassionate, uh, being more sensitive to the needs of the small business people. Uh, they're fighting for their lives right now, and yet the city uh, is viewed as someone who's not uh, being sensitive enough. They're not putting themselves in that position. Uh, they're sitting in a nice, comfortable office saying, well, let's do this and let's do that, without knowing the unintended consequences. I think they, um, they, they need to go out there and see what's going on, and I don't think we're, we're having that. Well, yeah, and none of them have ever made a payroll. They get paid every two weeks whether they work or not. That's right. And they have retirement. And they've never made a payroll, and these small businesses yeah. are hurting. If, if, you know, if I had to uh, label this what's going on, I would, I would call it the strangulation of Chinatown by the city. I like that, the strangulation yeah, of, Chinatown of Chinatown by the city. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, incredible, I, but that's what's going on. Th that's true. And, uh, and again, I asked the city leaders to come down, take a look, talk to the business people uh, instead of just talking to people who are unaware of the historic preservation, you know, uh, laws uh, and other things what's going on. They're, 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 they're not aware of the situation and decisions are being made. Do you think they care? Well, if you go by experience, no. No. Now, I remember Frank Fossey and Jeremy Harris loved, well, Fossey came grudgingly, of course, but Jeremy loved creating Chinatown, loved what it could be. He had this grand vision of what it could be. And even Mufi, they totally supported Chinatown and their efforts. And under Mufi, if you'll remember, we had the mayor's clean team. They were normal maintenance people, but they were called the mayor's clean team. So there was a pride in keeping Chinatown clean and because that's who they were. And then somebody comes along, new mayors, and the budget, and that's the first thing they cut is Chinatown. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fallback. It's an excuse. The city has um, again. I sat on the the neighborhood board for 16 years, so uh, it's always the budget. It's always uh, different reasons like safety for the pedestrians and all of that. But you know, they they apply this kind of statements to Chinatown, but not to other areas in the in Honolulu. And a good example is uh, Waikiki. So I think uh, if you ask me, Marshall. Uh, Honolulu has been the dumping ground or a test area for the city. Uh, I go to a lot of cities. Uh, I travel a lot. Many of, in fact, all of the large cities, they use Chinatown as a secondary economic engine. You know, we talk about Waikiki being an economic engine. That's fine. But Chinatown is really another economic engine too, but we're using it for, the city is using that as a testing ground for whatever comes to their mind. Well. <laughs> Yes. Uh, they don't see, I guess they don't, don't, well, you're right, they don't come down, they don't walk. When you go through the markets and you see all those vendors and uh, Keikaliki Mall, for instance, yes. in that uh, market, there were so many wonderful fruits and vegetables and fish from all of Asia and the Pacific, things that you never see anywhere else. That, I mean, it was incredible to see these different fruits and vegetables and the different languages. It, it's a microcosm in itself, and it's, it is an economic engine, and they don't see it. That, that's true, and uh, we tried bringing that up um, many years ago, 10, you know, five years ago, like having it being tied into uh, uh, maybe the, the tourist business, you know, have maybe better advertising or, or things like that, but no, it just fell on deaf ear. Uh, but, you know, Chinatown, like what you said, it offers diversity in culture, and this is what the tourists want. That's why they're traveling. They want to see diversity, but we don't recognize that. Yeah, and then they took out all the restrooms, all of the benches, so even if the tourists come down, there is no place to sit. There's, you know, wonderful restaurants, but there's, you know, no bathrooms. Yeah. So listen, we have a bit, take a break. We'll be back in a minute. 
And then I want you to tell us about the childhood in Chinatown. Okay, Marcia. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. <laughs> and I'm talking to Stanford Ewan, Mr. Chinatown. I, Stanford has been a part of Chinatown all of his life. So tell us about Chinatown as a child. What was it like yeah. growing up in Chinatown? That, that's true, Marcia. Uh, my dad, um, well, both of my parents were immigrants from China. And uh, Chinatown, as you know, is a gathering place for immigrants, uh, especially those of Chinese ancestors ancestries. Uh, my dad had several stores um, over the years. Uh, one of them was the restaurant just before the just before World War II and it was on Kukui Street. I was born just after that then he became uh, where he began to to um, uh, he started the noodle business. In other words he made a noodle factory. He made noodles that we sold to the restaurant and one ton peas, you know, one ton peas is where the, the wrappers for the, for the pork or the meat and you wrap the, uh, you wrap it around the meat. Those are the one ton peas. So we did that and we were the largest uh, noodle factory in the state or in the territory at that time. Uh, so as a child, I delivered noodles to all of these restaurants. So, uh, so they remembered me, many of these old timers and, and, uh, and that's where I learned to speak my, the language. Chinese language is the first language in my home, my house, uh, because my parents couldn't speak English. So I grew up speaking Chinese first, and then as I grew up in Chinatown, more so, you know, it kind of uh, uh, made me very um, a able to communicate with the merchants. Um, then we, uh, but but let's backtrack a little. My father had a, at that time he was a cook for wolf wolf fat okay. during the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and my mother was, uh, uh, her father, her family business was in Oahu Market as it, as it is today, okay. the same yeah. thing. Uh, so my father used to go down there to check her out and to impress <laughs> her. <laughs> and my, mo my mother used to tell me he was trying to show off his watch, you know, he had those chain, chain watch, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he was watch, swinging yeah. it around yeah. and um, <laughs> trying to impress her. But they got married and uh, during the 1930s, and and that's and I was born. And then they, they had several restaurants, and then eventually the noodle factory. Um, the longest we had about four different locations, but the longest location of the noodle factory was behind Wolfat. If you look at the alleys there, that's where the shop was. I think we have a picture. Do we have a picture of Wolfat? I think mm. we do. But anyhow, the, uh, the alleyways, so I grew up in those at that time during my childhood days in the fifth grade uh, or first grade. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you look closely, but today is gated. My signature was etched in the concrete. You know, I did all the things that little boys did, you, yeah. know, you know, etching my name and, uh, in the concrete. It's still there. Uh, the other... The other fond memories I had was we had a lot of burlesque shows there, you know. Oh, I remember, um, yes. Yeah, uh, Bertania Follies mm -hmm. and other, other uh, shows uh, at the Crystal Hotel. Uh, as a child, about, I remember about eight years old, uh, the dancing girls used to ask me to run errands for them. 
so I had access to the dancing girls' dressing room, and uh, so at that time it was I could buy cigarettes, and uh, so I used to I was the errand boy for cigarettes, gums, and other things. So, so I, I knew many of the dancing girls, so it was an enjoyable time, but. No samples. <laughs> yeah, I was just a boy, and you know, with, had no interest in other things except to fulfill my mission and getting them their cigarettes, and gum, or whatever. Um, and then we uh, uh, we moved to several locations within Chinatown. This is the noodle factory. And then eventually, we ended up next to Chang Hung Sut uh, on 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 the Powahi Street. Uh, so that's, that was my father's last stop, and that was about 1966 uh, when he sold the business, and, uh, and then we all grew up and did our thing. So now, as when you were a child, Chinatown was much larger. Yes. Yes. So in the 60s, when they started this urban renewal and the fight to keep Chinatown, yes. though it has come down to the size today, now... What, so the school that you were at, Mun Wong School, yeah. So that was in what is now uh, just outside of the boundaries of Chinatown. Yeah, uh, technically the boundaries of Chinatown is um, Baratanya Street. Right. And uh, Mun Lung School is right at the corner of uh, Baratanya and Mauna Kea. That's where Honolulu Tower is right. uh, and Honolulu Park Place. Coincidentally, I live there now. So oh. Honolulu Tower. So, so it's coming back to my roots. Uh, Munlun School was where I spent a lot of my childhood days and time there because those days, you know, there wasn't, uh, there weren't that many activities like what they have today. So, so after school, I would go down and help my dad for a couple of hours, then go to language school, Munlun School, and played my played with the kids, and and, and that was my routine. Uh, Munlun School has moved, since then it moved across the street to Kukui and Mauna Kea Street. It's still there. In fact, it's the nation's largest and oldest Chinese language school. Um, so, now, when you say Chinese language, but there's lots of Chinese languages, so what are we talking? Uh, good, good question. At that time, because most of our early generation uh, immigrants were from southern China, the Canton, Canton. or Guangzhou, mm -hmm. Uh, so we, it was mostly Cantonese. We learned Cantonese. I speak Cantonese today. Uh, but since then, the, the wave of immigrants are from other parts so of that's China. So Nihao. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Nihao is Cantonese, Nihau. yeah. Yeah, um, um, and, and then, so, so Mandarin became the predominant language, and in, in, in fact, it is the predominant language in China. So during the 1980s, uh, the school made a decision to switch over to Mandarin, to teach Mandarin. Uh, but we still have a, a program for Cantonese. So. I would think it would be good to have them both. Yes, yes, we do. And we have, uh, we have over 300 students during the weekdays, you know, per day. And during the weekend, we have adult classes too, maybe another 100 or so. Uh, so, but it's on the website if anyone's interested in that. So tell me about the uh, medical, the, the herbis and the acupuncture and all of those uh, Chinese health uh, facilities that are in Chinatown. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I've always been a firm believer in the uh, Chinese herbs and also their uh, liniment and camphor and ointments. Tiger Balm, I think we all heard about yes. that. Um, there are a few, and the good thing about uh, Honolulu uh, Herb Shop is that they're immigrants. They've been trained in China, so as they come down, as they come to Hawaii, you know, they brought over their skills and their craft. So, uh, so, and, and it's a very popular stop for the tourists also to see the different types of herbs, especially the insects. You know, and the 800-year-old eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Now, one more thing. There's different parts of China and different, um, I don't know if you call them ethnic, different, um, let's call them yeah, ethnic, yeah, yeah. Of, of Chinese. And so I understand that there is a large group 
from one family that's coming here for a reunion next year. Oh, uh, I am. Yeah. Go ahead. I am concerned about the way will they get those streets fixed before you have this influx of hundreds of people coming from this family for this family reunion. Yeah, uh, Honolulu Chinatown is the um, is a place where there's a lot of family reunion. Not just families, but organizations, national organizations. Example would be like the Chinese from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. That's a large organization worldwide. And uh, a few years ago, they held their conference in Honolulu. So that's one example. And there's other examples, too, of different types of uh, uh, international organizations holding their conferences uh, in Honolulu, Chinatown. Uh, so it's, it's very common to have that in addition to many of the uh, distinguished visitors from China. And these are on the foreign, on the ministry level. In other words, the ministry level is, would be equivalent to our cabinet level. Uh, you know, the, the United States president and you got his cabinet. So we have a lot of ministers from China visiting Honolulu. And uh, they would come down and visit Munlun School, for example. Uh, so we would take them around. And uh, well, just last week we had the mayor from Guangzhou. You know, he was visiting Chinatown, and we were hoping the mayor, uh, uh, Mayor Caldwell, would remove those barriers. But no. it's not. That hasn't oh. been done. Oh. So. Did the mayor meet him? Did Caldwell meet? No, he did not meet oh. uh, any any of us. He's too busy with other issues. With the rail. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, dear, dear, dear. We are just about out of time, but this has been a real pleasure, Stanford, just, just being with you. This has been a real joy, and we have to do, you will come back again. And of course, Marcia. I mean, you know, you and I, we go way back, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we talk, we, we've done many research, photos and yes. pictures of Chinatown and all of that, so, yeah, yeah, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Great. Thank you so much, and aloha. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.